grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's great to worship with you all today on this Mother's Day, and graduation is in the air. I know Ben's graduating today. Anyone else actually have the graduation happening today? I know we got big weekends next weekend for St. Joe, but congratulations again, Ben. What a wonderful time of year this is. Uh, we are going through this message series on the Holy Spirit, thinking about uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit is indispensable to us as Christians. In our everyday walk with Christ, we can't live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so we are just considering some ways, not all of the ways, but some ways that the Holy Spirit helps us and empowers us to live the Christian life. And so today we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit who is the revealer. And you might say, well, what is he the revealer of? You're just going to have to pay attention today. You're just going to have to follow me through this message. And if you get lost, I can't help you. So here we go. We're going to we're going to read through uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. If you are using the Pew Bibles, the page numbers are on the screen for those who need that. As you're flipping to 1 Corinthians 2, just a reminder, if you are visiting with us, if you're new with us, in the back of the pews, we have these purple connect cards. We would love to uh, connect with you if you would just leave us some basic information, and after service, you can just bring those purple connect cards either myself or pastor cindy or pastor aaron and we'd love just to get in touch with you and welcome you and just see how we can get you more involved in the life of the church but here we are first corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 through 16 paul writes and so it was with me brothers and sisters when i came to you i did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as i proclaimed to you the testimony about god for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Hint, hint. Okay. The spirit searches for all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we, we may understand what God has freely given to us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you are planning a surprise party for someone, I am probably one person that you do not want to tell about the surprise party. Just a fair warning. Let me just invite you that if you are planning a surprise party for someone else, let it be a surprise for me as well. I don't know how you're going to do that. I'll leave that up to you. 
It was a miracle from heaven that I didn't ruin Peggy's retirement surprise party luncheon thing. Peggy, there were a number of times where Cindy and I, we had to march out of the office and get out of there really fast because it was just going to come bubbling over. Now, over the years, I have taken the element out of surprise, of surprise out of a number of, of parties, and so that's why I stand up here and give you this warning. I can, I can point to a, a track record. Uh, now, I can plan an incredible surprise party. I can do that, and that's fine. But if it's your surprise party, I will ruin it in a heartbeat. So <laughs> call it a, a character flaw, but I prefer to think as some unconscious part of me that just wants to tell people good news. So it's, it's not that bad of a thing. Isn't it awesome to be the bearer of good news? Isn't it awesome to, to know that what you have to say is what somebody is going to want to hear? It's quite the switch for us. We seem to always expect the worst. What do we think of immediately when someone schedules a time to meet with us? If you're like me, you kind of go to doomsday scenarios, right? And you start thinking, what, what did I do? What are they mad about? What are they angry about? What, what are they going to talk about? We do a lot of worrying over things that might be said, don't we? And so for, for my case, it's a nice feeling knowing that what, what you have to say is going to make someone happy, even if it ruins a surprise. You know it's going to bring a, a smile to their face and, and joy to their life. And, and so this is what it means to be an evangelist, to be a bringer, to be a bearer of good, of good news, someone who reveals good news to other people. That's what the word evangelist means. And so I, I like to look at it like this that I'm not one who ruins surprise parties. I am just a revealer of good news like the Holy Spirit. All right? <laughs> Paul wrote, yeah, don't think of yourself so high, right? Pride goes before the fall. Is that right? <laughs> Paul wrote this letter to this community in, in first century Cor Corinth, and specifically one of the issues in the church was that they were squabbling over leaders in the church. Paul, Apollos, Peter, they were all picking sides, saying, well, I follow this one or I follow that one. Paul, as we know, planted the church in Corinth, and after him comes along Apollos, who did a great job. And of course, everyone had heard about Peter and his time spent with Jesus, his exploits and all of his acts. And so the preferences for, for one leader over another probably involved things like perceived reputation, uh, stories of exploits and accomplishments, and perhaps charisma in front of other people. How, how did they do standing and talking in front of other people? Now, this was a big thing back then as it is now. How a person looks and sounds while talking in front of other people, that's a big thing in our determination of whether or not we listen to them. So thumbs up if I'm doing okay this morning. Am I looking okay before you this morning? All right, okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so, so to open this letter, Paul says to the Corinthians that the message of the cross is going to sound like foolishness to the learned or to the wise. The message that he was sent to preach, he said, is going to sound like foolishness to those who would think of themselves wise in their own eyes. And then Paul just openly admits something to us, the simplicity of his message. Paul, in fact, kind of just comes out and says it. He says, I'm a one-trick pony. I've got one message that I preach and only one message that's going to work. And so, actually, if we back up to chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verses 23 through 24, Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God. And so to the teachers of the law, to the philosophers of the age, to those who believed themselves to be wise in their own sight, Paul is saying that this message of Christ crucified to them is going to be foolishness and it's going to be a stumbling block. But he says, it's all I've got. Because this is, this message of Christ crucified is the power of God. And so again, in verses 1 through 5, one of the things that gets me in this passage is how Paul says to them, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom, right? How many speakers would want to get up in front of their, their audience and say, hey, 
when I stood before you, when I spoke to you, I didn't have eloquence. I didn't speak with human wisdom. In fact, Paul then goes on to say in verse 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Paul is saying that the success of my preaching had nothing to do with my own ability to stand up and look good or to speak well. It had everything to do with the power of the Spirit attached to that message of Christ and Him crucified. So Paul didn't come to Corinth as one who was strong and confident in himself. In fact, he says that he came in an attitude of weakness and in a spirit of fear and trembling. And perhaps every preacher who's ever stood up to read the the words of God, to, to speak what we believe to be God's word to people, feel a sense of trembling and fear. In fact, if you ever meet a preacher who doesn't approach preaching with a sense of trembling and fear, Find another preacher to listen to. Can I say that this morning? If, you don't, if, if, you, if there's a preacher who's always confident in everything that they say before the people of God, my friends, that's something to watch out for. But Paul says that the power behind his message wasn't his wise and persuasive words, but it's a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And it goes hand in hand with that message, that simple message of Christ and him crucified. Now, I wish... This was something that I heard emphasized in my preaching classes through the years. Over and above, I mean, there's good things to talk about when you talk about sermon structure, talk about the style of delivery, right? But I wish I heard more of this idea that it's more about the power of the Spirit and the message than it is my ability to get up and hope to sound good or look good in front of human beings. My friends, public speaking is harder than it's ever been. Social scientists would say that people's attention spans are shrinking year over year. I don't even know what they would say, what a person's attention span is. And nowadays, people are more apt to be influenced by their YouTube videos that they watch or podcasts that they listen to, social media, the 24-7 news cycle, more than perhaps 52 sermons from their local church. And that's how many people are showing up to church 52 Sundays a year, right? And so nowadays, the task of of preaching to people is harder than it's ever been. So maybe you can understand the temptation for a preacher to want to get up and perhaps use a gimmick or two to get you to remember a sermon or to get you to remember a point. And so Paul's words to the church in Corinth is good news for the preacher who struggles with the temptation to compete with the many influences of culture. Paul's words are also good news to you, my friends, the listener that's here this morning, who may have already forgotten what book we read a scripture out of this morning, right? Paul's words are good news to you who might be sitting here today and your mind is in a hundred different places, distracted by different thoughts, sounds, or sights. Paul's words are good news to you who might say, give me something simple to latch on to. Paul's words are good news because the simple message of Christ is this, is that this message of Christ crucified, to get this, is the very power and wisdom of God. That message, Christ crucified, is the very power and wisdom of God. Of God. It's so simple, but my friends, we can't underestimate how transforming that message is. And so the message is the medium through which the Holy Spirit reveals, as Paul says in verse 7 of the text that we read, God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Isn't that something God destined your glory before time began? Can you even grasp such a thought this morning to the one who is wise in their own eyes? That message of Christ crucified makes absolutely no sense 
whatsoever. To say that this is power, that a man nailed on a cross is power and wisdom? How can, how can we proclaim such a thing? Power would have been Peter letting, Jesus letting Peter just go crazy with the sword when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. That would have been power. Power would have been Jesus rising from the dead and, and instead of sort of hiding out and showing himself to little groups at a time, Jesus just coming forth with a blast of light and wiping all of his enemies out. That would have been power. But Christ crucified is power. How does that make sense? And so, my friends, what we perceive in our human wisdom to be weakness and powerlessness was the very triumph and power of God over sin and death. And this is what the Spirit reveals to us. This is what the Spirit reveals to us. Listen again to these amazing words in verses 8 through 12. None of the rulers understood this. For if they had understood this wisdom from God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind can conceive, the things that God has prepared for those who love him, these things are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirits. I love the words as Paul goes on to say that the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of who is from God. The, the Spirit who knows the thoughts of God is the one who lives within your very being so that we may understand, get this, so we may understand what God has, finish it for me, God has given us that Spirit that knows the mind of Christ so that we would know and understand what God has freely given us through the power of Christ crucified. My friends, that is a nugget. That's a little zip file that's going to have to unzip in your soul throughout the week if we might let it. But that is a truth that is so glorious for us to understand today that the Spirit speaks from the very core of our being, the deep things of God. The Spirit reveals to us the mystery that is hidden from the self-proclaimed wise. Those who would say, I'm wise, are the ones who miss this simple truth of the gospel. The Spirit is the one, kind of like me, spilling the beans about the surprise party that is to come. The Spirit's the one who's saying, hey, the day of the Lord is fast approaching. It's coming, my friends, when this new creation, this new heaven and earth, is going to come in, it's going to usher in this current age that we are living in will be no more and all things will be made well. The Spirit is speaking those things to our hearts. And so when we see a world that's decaying and fracturing right in front of us, the Spirit inside of us reveals to us that very truth. That even though Christ was crucified, he yet lived. And so even though things may be looking terrible for us in this world right now, there is a beautiful thing that God is doing and that God is going to usher in. My friends, Christ crucified is the power of God for all those who face rejection or unjust persecution. Christ crucified is the power of God for all of you who know that you are weak and fragile. Christ crucified is the power of God for all who can't see beyond just this day because of anxiety and stress or depression. To you, to the ones that are gathered, to the children of God, the Spirit reveals the victory and the triumph that is on the other side of the grave. It says, even on the worst day, my friends, there is reason to believe. There's reason to hope. For you who are weary and, and broken, the Spirit reveals light 
shining in the darkness. For you who feel alone and abandoned, the Spirit reveals the footprints of Jesus that are with you and have gone before you. Listen to this, my friends. Your worst day on this earth is not uncharted waters. The worst day that you will face on this earth is not uncharted waters because God's eternal spirit who spoke order out of chaos from the very beginning of creation, this spirit is at the helm of your life. And so despair not, my friends. Christ crucified is the wisdom and it is the power of God upon which all things in creation rest. Whether you feel it or whether you don't, that is a truth that we can latch ourselves onto today. Let me close up with this quotation from Isaiah 64, 4, because this is the quote that Paul uses in his, in his text. But here's the full quote. Since ancient times, no one has heard No ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait on him. Perhaps we could say that's the Spirit's job is to reveal to you day in and day out, over and over and over again, the good things of Christ that belong to you even on the worst day of your life. My friends, the good things that God has for you, abundant life, eternal life, green pastures, still waters. And if you say, well, that's all good and great, but life sort of feels like the valley of the shadow of death. Well, my friends, I've got good news for you. There's a shepherd in the valley of the shadow of death, and he's preparing an abundant table for you in the presence of your enemies, in the presence of of the forces that would seek to harm and destroy you. My friends, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. The Hebrew word for follow means to harass, means to hunt you down. And so, my friends, think of goodness and mercy as the Holy Spirit who is revealing to you day by day, hunting you down, confronting you with God's very goodness, with God's very own self. My friends, this is the work of the Spirit, to confront you every single day with the good things that belong to you in Christ Jesus. I'm going to borrow this question from Pastor Scott. What's your next step? (laughs) What is your next step? Your next step is to literally step out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit who wants to reveal the goodness of God through your life. That's your next step, to leave this building in the power of the Holy Spirit who reveals God's goodness to you and through you. My friends, those who have ears to hear, let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Let us pray.